Hey guys, welcome back to another Next Core video. Today I'm gonna do something a little different. I know that usually we've gave up to the ban list discussions and the tier list, but I wanted to give it a shot. Today I wanted to talk about the premium restrictions. And I wanna talk about this because I think premium is a pretty important format to kind of keep alive. Because a lot of people didn't like premium. Kinda of wanna talk about my personal thoughts on this restriction list, how it's gonna make a difference for the premium format and what the next steps for that as a player base could be for us to kind of help initiate premium be a more engaging format in the community. Before going right into the discussion, I really quickly want to talk about our sponsor, Triple Sleeve TCG. Triple Sleeve TCG, as you guys may already know, is a website where you can go and get playset bundles. And on top of that is a one-stop shop where you can get sleeves, deck boxes, you can get character sleeves, as well as clear outer over sleeves, including the hard shell ones if you want to do like some hard over sleeves. Those are really fun if you kind of want to mess with your friends a little bit and they can pick up your deck and be like, what the heck are these hard sleeves, man? This is insane or if you just like really hard oversleeves. Don't even know what hard oversleeves are. Get some and try them out. Thanks again to Triple Sleeve TCG for sponsoring our videos and working with us. And I think you guys should definitely check them out for your playsets, singles, and other Vanguard products you may need in your future. Without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump on in into this ban list. Right away, we're gonna get started on what the details about it for. The effective date for this restriction list, restriction list is Friday, October 1st and it's only for the premium format. So these are just the premium cards that are being affected. More information on the official website, so I'm gonna keep going from there. I'm grabbing these from Cardfight Vanguard's official Twitter. So if you're wondering where I'm getting this from, this is where I'm finding the images. First things first is we're gonna talk about Ultima and Over Triggers, which is a little sad because it was fun to do against Atlas that one time. Atlas, if you're watching, I know you remember. Ultima, what it does is it lets you search any trigger in your deck, stack it on the top of your deck, and then whatever trigger you reveal is applied to all your units. You reveal an over trigger, all of your units receive 100 million power. Kind of broken, so this makes sense. It was especially broken with the trial deck over trigger because you would apply it twice, meaning all your units get over 200 million. Also meaning that if your opponent does get an over trigger, it still didn't matter. Like it, it just, didn't matter what would happen. Having to decide this does make uh, decks that run Ultima a lot weaker, I would say, in terms of Ultima being a guaranteed kill. Because if your opponent just put the over trigger back in, like that was just it. Now they have to decide, it's basically, are you gonna decide to run Ultima as your end game? Or do you wanna keep the over trigger if you're playing like Luard? and you want to get that over trigger during the uh, more Festa turn just to make those attacks way stronger than they already were. Me personally, I'm probably going to stick with Ultima because I just like double stacking crits, but this was a good, this was a good hit. Next thing is going to be Bermuda Triangle, so go into that first. Bermuda's first thing is Fina and Potpourri. So what Fina does is its main act ability, when this unit attacks hits, they activate even if they did not hit. That is important because with Potpourri, it's GB1 is when this attack hits a Vanguard, you pick one of your other units, you bounce it, and then if the unit is in har and if this unit is in harmony, you can uh, call another card to your hand. So this is kind of like an effective loop. Kind of unfair since you can just swing with Potpourri. The on hit doesn't really matter, so get off your on hit and call something else in addition. So that makes sense why they wanted to make it where like you can only have either Fina or Potpourri. Can't do both. Next up is Dark Irregulars, Dantarian, and Ashurda. This is another loop that kind of goes on. So you have to pick either Dantarian or Ashurda. So what Dantarian basically does, it's the first skill that's important. It's continuous when you call a card to the Guardian Circle. You can call a grade two or greater card from your soul, right? So you would have been able to have called Ashurda. What Ashurda does, it's not listed here, but what Ashurda does is it has two things. The continuous, if your soul is seven or more, it gets 5k shield. And then when it's retired from the guard circle, it goes back into your soul. If you have like four Ashurdas in your soul, theoretically, right? You get all four in there. You can just call all four out. And then if you have seven or more, they all get an additional five shields. So you're calling out 40 shield for free. You can, you can call as many of these cards just as you can call grade two or greater cards from your soul. So you just call all four Shurtas, 40 shield, easy, kind of unfair if you can just do this for free every time you would guard. So to make it fair, you can do one or the other. So obviously that needed to be addressed. So for Pale Moon, you can only use one of the type below in your deck. So you can either do Purple Trapezists, Jumping Jills, or Flying Peritons, you can't do all three, you can't do two. You only do one and that's it. Purple Trapezus is when you call, basically when you call Trapezus, you pick another card, you put it in your soul and you call something else out. So it's a good, you play it, pull something in and out. 
Jumping Jill is similar. It's when it's placed from your soul, uh, you put another rear guard into your soul and you call a non grade two card to your rear guard circle to the back row. It's a little more restricted, but it's a grade two card. So you can kind of create a column for it. So that's nice. Then you have Flying Parrington. Uh, Magia, GB1, when it's placed on rear guard circle, you soul charge one, choose one card from your soul and you call it, yeah. It has to be in the same call as Parrington and at the end of that turn, you put it back in your soul. So what Magia always does, the called card always goes back. This honestly already makes sense. You, you could, cause you can, you know, just call Flying Parrington and you use Parrington to call out Trapezus and then use Trapezus skill to put something back in, call out Jumping Jill and then Jumping Jill skill you call out another card to the back row. I'm no Pale Moon expert, but I can see some silliness going on here. So it makes sense that you don't wanna make all of these really quick and easy card manipulations. Dark Side Princess and the Harry G unit, these are all things that can also additionally help you create more attacks during the turn. So I feel like just for the sake of making a well-balanced turn with Pale Moon and also just for the sake of time, because the amount of time you'd have to take just to set these up, just an easy decision for the choice restriction there. We're gonna go into Zarzan, Tempest Spheres, Bendy, and Taro. So we'll start with Zarzan and Tempest Spheres since they're kind of related. Uh, Zarzan was obviously hit to one, but now you can just not use it at all. Uh, van or rear, so if you ride it or call it, you soul plus one. You call up the two units that are vanillas, no cons, no acts, no autos, so just a vanilla card. Call two of them, and if you call two cards, you choose a Cyclone in your G-Zone, you turn it face up and you draw two. Amazing card when this wasn't limited to one. I mean, it was, even when it was limited to one, it was still great. Turbo out your G-Zone, you're drawing cards, you're filling your board. Cyclone made all your vanillas, extra 5K for each face up copy of Cyclone. So that just made them stronger. Just eliminating Zarzan, but she was like, this was a mistake. This card didn't need to exist. It's just way too fast. G-Zones get filled up too fast. It was a fun idea to get people to run vanillas to trade off to get two more powerful G units in the early game, but it was a little too much, uh, especially since heal triggers are vanillas and you can just search those out for G guardians. Speaking of that, Tempest Sphere, Counterblast 1, you turn a uh, card in your G zone face up, so you probably turn over Cyclone. Uh, you look at seven cards on the top of your deck and you reveal two units with that are vanillas and you add them to your hand. So you could search vanilla heals. You could just added two heals to your hand. G guards, easy. Right, uh, Tempest Sphere was very generic, so you could just flip any G unit face up, search for any vanilla, was not Cyclone specific, so that makes sense why you can't run those at all. The whole early game vanilla deck was kind of a bad idea, but they're not hitting Cyclone. I don't know if the Cyclone decks will be any good. I still feel like maybe some decks will still run them as flip fodder. If you're gonna be running like a vanilla blaster blade, you wanna make that thing good that would make sense so i feel like this was a good choice let's move on to shadow paladin we got freezing witch bendy key cards that made bendy a really good card were obviously um blaster dark and phantom blaster dragon so what bendy does if your vanguard's blaster dark you soul blast one you retired this and you search for pbd you write it as stand and you can't activate the act abilities of pbd it doesn't matter in premium because you just wanted to sit on that grade three right when you're on that grade three early game the next time it comes to your turn you can just stride so if you went first you road blaster dark use bendy skill you're on pvd all of a sudden you got a force marker on it now you're at grade three early and then your opponent turns to grade two and now you're able to stride the following turn this whole early game ride to grade three as soon as you can was one of the reasons why Ezel was really good in premium. On top of that, Bendy can be searched really easily. You can run it at one and you can run it like four Leofalls. Leofalls still a really good card. It searches any grade one when it's placed. The other key part is, well, how are you gonna get Blaster Dark? And the answer is Nemen. Like that's the answer to everything. You can use Leofall to get you Nemen and use Nemen to get you Bendy. Like the end of the day, Nemen comes down to it but also you don't want to hit Nemen because Nemen is such a good key card to get Shadow Paladin going. And I feel like it'd be really unfair to hit Nemen since you have a lot of these cards that kind of were revolved around Nemen searching them out to begin with. So I feel like instead of hitting Nemen, hitting Bendy seemed a lot more fair because the whole point, they didn't want people to ride to grade three so fast. Having Nemen out is fine. Let's go on to Taro. It's main ability revelation. So when it's placed, you go to the top card, you put it in the soul, you leave it on the top of your deck, sure. Most important thing is the GB1, which is you put it to the bottom of your deck. When this is soul blasted, you put it back and you stand a rear guard. This was really good with Wise Man and then also really good with Valkyrian because you can swing a Valkyrian and then if you have another card that 
on attack Soul Blast, you can Soul Blast the Taro, put it back in your deck, and restand the Valkyrian, right? You could, this is all like really easy stuff you can do, or you can just restand the Wise Man, which is what Wise Man did was on attack Soul Blast 3, and it gets 5k. After you Soul Blast Taro, you put it back in your deck and you restand Wise Man, and then you would probably Soul Blast the other two cards, which were when it's Soul Blast, you use Soul Charge 2. Forgot, it's like which of oranges and which of grapes, I've forgetting their names. And then if you created the right stack later in the game, you would know because you keep putting the Taros back when you would Soul Charge your Taros, Soul Blast them back out, restand them. It was a big mess. And Bushy finally said, no more Taro. It kind of sucks because Taro really, literally just got reprinted in Revival Collection. It sucks that we have nice foil Taros that people can't use. So Taro needed to be hit. Moving on to Jumio Kongo when it's placed and at the end of each turn, so on top of the turn you wrote it, uh, your opponent chooses six cards from their hand and they discard the rest until they're left with those six. That's already really like crazy and premium just because the way that people can just draw a bunch of cards with any deck really, like even like in Victor, you just draw a bunch of cards and the fact that it's like at the end of each turn, your opponent is starting their turn with six cards. If you have a grade three in the soul, your opponent chooses four instead. That sucks, especially if you are just going to keep riding Jami Okongo, you ride it. At the beginning of your turn, your opponent goes down to four cards because you just rode on top of another another Jami Okongo probably, and then you stride on top of that. So you just eliminated their hand for the most part, then you go into a G unit to keep abusing them. You could go into units like Mujin Lord, which is kind of blast and you turn face up copy of itself or yeah of a uh, Mujin Lord and for each face up card in your G zone, you dominate an opponent's rear guard. So now they, you have four face up G units and they have, you have four units swinging your opponent's Vanguard and they only have four cards in their hand. They have to guard all four attack. That's already their hand for the turn. And then you get three free swings for the most part. It makes it unfair that you get to control your opponent's hand that easily. Let's get rid of it. So John Mekongo makes sense. Next up is Nui Dao. Nui Dao's uh, regular skill striding, obviously. Uh, when it's in the G zone, act, so face down. If you have five more units with the same name and your Vanguard's at grade three, you Soul Blast one, I believe, and you stride this card onto your Vanguard circle. And until the end of the turn, when this unit attacks, when the Vanguard attacks, your opponent has to call five cards from their hand. Like, that's a lot of cards. The other skill is when it attacks, you turn a card in your G zone face up and you stand all your rear guards with the same name as one of your rear guards. We can, we can all obviously see this. So the other part is it's way too easy to get off with Yuga. And I feel like hitting Hugo wouldn't have been the solution. It's just the fact that it's an act ability. So you can go off and use Hugo's skill to board wipe your opponent already. You're searching out cards. And then at the end of the turn, you can just put cards back into your soul and filter and search out um, Shiryuki and all this other stuff. It was basically Hugo plus. Like it was just Hugo with a G zone. And this unit just kind of made it already too broken. Uh, we have Stealth Rogue of Concealment Tamba. It's a Shadow Stitch ability, so it's when your other unit um, doesn't hit, right? So what it does is you choose a normal unit for your drop zone and you put it back to the bottom of your deck. At the end of the battle that a unit didn't hit, this gets 3k. I believe it's the recycling and being able to then pull out more things with other Shadow Stitch abilities to kind of keep it, keep the stat Shadow Stitching going. It's continuously gaining power. So if your opponent's swinging, Shadow Stitch, you know, uh, it goes, doesn't hit, you put something in the bottom, it gets 3k, and then you use another unit, same Shadow Stitch, to call something in the same column. So now that thing can hit, right? And you do more Shadow Stitches from there on. Some type of loop or combo. As of right now, I'm not sure. So let's move on to Link Joker. So with Link Joker, we have Terminal Starvator Zinc. Act, put in a soul if you have a Vanguard with Chaos, Chaos Breaker, and your opponent has a locked card, you kind of charge Soul Charge too. This kind of came out of nowhere because Chaos wasn't really that big of an issue as far as I know in Premium. Maybe just with the new support coming out with Volume Collection, maybe having really easy access to Soul and Counter Charge is, would make the deck way too abusive. That's kind of as far as I go, but as of right now, Chaos doesn't seem to be a problem. This seems to just be like some future proofing of some sort. 
Let's move on to Gastiel. So Gastiel was a big issue that people were addressing. They're like, Gastiel needs to get hit. Eric, if you're watching this, like you're the one that was telling me this whole time, like I'm gonna keep my eye on premium because if they keep Gastiel, I don't know what I'm gonna do because <laughs> that's gonna be unfair. So what Gastiel does, when a card is put into your soul, your front row gets 3K and the stacks are every time you soul charge your front row is gaining immense power other skills act once per turn you kind of us one you flip over a g unit you suit your deck for two cards and you put them into your soul shuffle your deck and the g unit gains all of the abilities of the two cards put into your soul good copy no life king death anchor and okay everyone knows and okay and then you could copy the other guest deal the grade three for v series so what this guest deal did was at the beginning of your battle phase you could kind of blast one, you draw a card and your opponent chooses one of the following effects for every five cards in your soul. Four possible effects your opponent chooses, which are either your front row gets a crit. So all, all of those units that gained all that power in your front row now have crits. Your opponent's Vanguard increases or decreases to one. The auto abilities do not activate while you're defending. So you can't use the auto abilities of your G Guardians. Last but not least, your opponent chooses a card from his or her hand and puts it into her damage zone face down. So, or they could take a damage. Hitting 20 souls, probably not gonna be that hard at all. And speaking of 20 soul, let's talk about after use NOK's effect. What are you going to ride? Hope on Damp. What does Hope on Damp do? When placed, if your soul has 20 cards or more until the end of the turn when your opponent would call cards from hand to guard circle, they must call cards with the original total of 20 at a time. Not 20 or more, not 20 or less. It has to be exactly 20 at a time. So this is all kind of unfair because you're comboing Gastille's effect, NLK's effect, and then NLK's effect to ride into Hope on Damp. And all of these are going off all because you were able to use these effects for the rest of the turn. This, this unit needed to go. Let's go on to Pale Moon again. This time it's gonna be Visible Songster. Songster's ability is auto Vanguard Circle. Uh, when your unit attacks while boosted, you kind of lost one and you put two other rear guards in your soul and you call a card from your soul to rear guard circle. So Songster's whole thing, you would be able to loop the number of attacks you're able to do just for every time you could pay a counterblast. This was also thanks to cards like Trouble Trebezist, Periton, Jumping Jill. So cards that would help you fill up your board, right? Loops are bad. We don't want loops in Vanguard because loops stall out to time. It's just not a healthy thing for the game state. Moving on to Bermuda Triangle, we got Troyce. So, Troyce's okay. main thing is that it just lets you stride the minute you ride your grade three and that's kind of unfair. Same thing with like Phantom Blaster Dragon and Bendy. You just don't want people to be able to stride super early, you know, unless you're Gold Paladin. <laughs> Troyce's thing is act when it's in your hand, you count plus one, and you can call this to Rear Guard Circle. And you choose a card from your hand, return it to your deck, and if your Vanguard's grade two or greater, you search your deck for Rivier and you ride it. If you're already on grade three, if you wrote them from a grade three unit, you choose a face down Rivier G unit and you stride it. The other skill is Soul Blast One when you're grade four Rivier attacks you can restand it so that's just an extra attack if you're going first and you can stride before your opponent even rides to grade three it does feel a little unfair because then they can't use their g guardians i mean they can reduce the crits and the, give your vanguard power with the new grade three heals but i feel like that's not enough we are moving on to stand trigger rulings this one's really interesting so the new rule for stand triggers is a rear guard that is stead by a stand trigger cannot perform drive checks until the end of the turn. If a rear guard reveals a uh, stand trigger for its drive check, that unit stands by the effect but can no longer uh, perform drive checks. For example, I'll use the vision token since that's the easiest one. <laughs> After the vision token attacks, you perform drive check. First checks a stand trigger, you restand the vision token, right? You do your second check. It's a crit, let's say it's a crit, right? Your stood vision token now after you perform that second check can no longer perform twin drive. This was also really important with Valkyrian because uh, what Valkyrian does is you look at five cards, you put a card into the drop into the drop zone and this gets drive check equal to the grade of the card you put in the drop zone. So if you put a grade five, because Valkyrian is a grade five, look at top five, discard a five, you now quintuple drive. Swing of Valkyrian because Valkyrian can uh, attack while it's on the astral plane. You get a stand trigger like Taro. And you can just restand Valkyrian and get another quintuple drive, right? Or it restands, no more drive checks. So that's pretty much it for, I would say, the ones that stood out to me the most that are really important, I'd say, is Dantarian not being able to loop shield. Yeah, Steel's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Songster not being able to loop, loop is nice. That's that stood out to me as well. Pale Moon, obviously, the fact that you're kind of like being stuck with just one set of 
like field building card, Parrington, Jill, or Trapezist. No more long-term stuff. No more being able to stride super fast with cards like Bindi. The other thing here we're obviously seeing is not being able to abuse Jamio Kongo. Nui Dao is just a really strong card, honestly. That just should have been hit a long time ago. Uh, Zinc, Control, and then Tamba, Shadow Stitch stuff. I am really excited to get into Premium now because I feel like these major hits really made the format a lot easier to get into without kind of jumping in and being like, what is going on? My opponent just strode once and then all of a sudden they, they just controlled the whole game. I'm glad to see a lot of these really impactful cards and changes are getting addressed. This is a really great step in the right direction. Hopefully after the dust, the dust settles and we kind of see how the format looks, Maybe we'll start addressing other cards in the future, but I don't think there's anything that comes to mind immediately that needs to be addressed. So we'll see. This is already a great step for premium, and I'm really excited to start playing some premium games now. This is kind of fun. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to do more discussions like this in the near future. And leave a comment below if there's anything that you want to add, any suggestions, or if you just want to see more of these discussions in the near future. Again, my name is Richard, and I'll see you on the next video.